A um, couple things before we get started. Um, if everyone can, everyone can make sure they mute themselves so that we just hear our speaker. Um, uh, as you know, all our talks are brought to you by uh, brought to us by Cape Cod Five, uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings, and all the books that are um, part of our tour. A part of our series are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth. So we hope that you uh, make sure that you uh, participate and, and uh, help out the locals here. Um, our speaker tonight, this is his first book. His, his name is Bradford Pearson. Um, he's a former features editor of Southwest Magazine. He's written for the New York Times, Esquire, Time, and Salon Magazines. Um, he grew up in Hyde Park, New York, which is uh, also the, the hometown of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which is a key part of his story. He's coming to us from Philadelphia. Um, would you welcome our guest tonight, Bradford Pearson? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me. I, uh, I'm really honored to be here, and, and I appreciate everybody attending. So what I thought I would do tonight is go through some of the history of the Eagles of Heart Mountain, which is um, my book that just came out in January, uh, and then also sort of go through some of the images and things and give a little bit of the story behind those. The images that you're going to see tonight that are up on the slideshow are pretty different from the ones that I actually ended up including in the book for the most part. And the reason I want to do that was just if for some reason you've already picked up the book or, or have already read it or have gotten it out of the library, I wanted you all to see a, a little bit something different um, than what you would get if you just had the, the book sitting on your shelf right now. So let me start this. Okay. So like I said, the Eagles of Heart Mountain. Um, so I figured we might start talking about Heart Mountain itself. So this is Heart Mountain. It takes place, um, you know, this is in, in Northwest Wyoming, which is a pretty desolate part of the United States. Um, this part of Wyoming was so far removed from the rest of the population centers of the state of Wyoming that at first, um, when they were planning the West, they thought that they should just include it in Montana because it was so much close to everything else in Montana. But the mountain you actually see there is sort of this geological conundrum that people have been trying to figure out for decades. So 48 million years ago in Southern Montana, something happened and geologists are still trying to figure out what exactly happened at that point. But, uh, what we do know is that a 500 square mile chunk of dolomite and limestone was picked up in southern Montana, flew 25 miles south, and landed right here in present day Wyoming. And this is Heart Mountain. Um, it was the largest surface rock slide in uh, the history of the planet. And over the next, you know, tens of millions of years, everything sort of eroded until we just ended up with this 8,100 square foot nub of a mountain uh, in Northwest Wyoming. And sort of the idea of what people think happened was there was this eruption. And then the way that it traveled south to Montana was kind of like, if you imagine, if you've seen Back to the Future, the idea of like what a hoverboard would do. So they, they think that some sort of thermal, hydrothermal gas sort of carried this mountain uh, 25 miles south. And so this was what greeted the uh, 11,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans who uh, were unfortunately placed in, um, hmm, sorry, some uh, few things ended up here out of order. So this was, um, uh, for, for millions of years, the land of Heart Mountain was uninhabited. It was so desolate that no one ever stopped there. There was no permanent settlement uh, in this portion of Wyoming for, for, for millions and millions of years. Native tribes passed through, uh, fur trappers came through, but realized that the, uh, <laughs> the value of any fur trapping would be uh, overcome by how easily it was to be eaten by a mountain lion or grizzly bear, so they quickly left as well. It wasn't until the, uh, the late 19th century that some settlers started settling in this part of the Bighorn Basin, but there was never any permanent settlement on, on this land right here. 
so, but that, that's until the federal government decided to remove 120,000 people from the West Coast of the United States. Uh, this group right here um, is a group from California who is known as the Native Sons of the Golden West. And we sort of think of Pearl Harbor as the precipitating event that led to the incarceration of uh, 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans in the United States. But what I tried to do with the book was show that Pearl Harbor was just the, the final, sort of the, the final blow in this decades long fight by uh, white politicians and farmers and ranchers and civic groups up and down the West Coast whose uh, express purpose in some cases was just the removal of Japanese, Chinese immigrants and their eventual Chinese American and Japanese American children. So this group right here, like I said, is the Native Sons of the Golden West as their name uh, <laughs> so uh, thoughtfully puts out. They're, they're from folks who were born in the land that became California. Um, but it was only reserved for those folks who were born in California who were white. So the Native Sons of the Golden West fought to preserve California as this bastion of uh, white America for, for decades. And for years, they fought Japanese Americans and tried to set up immigration quotas and you know illegal land laws and housing restrictions. And what they did was um, they fought for decades. So they fought from uh, uh, the early part of the 20th century all the way up through Pearl Harbor. And it wasn't until after Pearl Harbor and after World War II was over that the group sort of pivoted to become what is now known as more of a, a, a civic group. So folks like Richard Nixon were um, native sons of the Golden West. And he actually invited them into the Oval Office while he was president. What they did was they teamed up with ranchers and politicians across the West Coast after Pearl Harbor to sort of lead to this incarceration of 120,000 Americans. And the reason that they did that was because over the intervening decades, Japanese and Japanese Americans on the West Coast had become so dominant in agriculture that they had really pushed out um, and, 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 and overworked and, and and made the land a lot better than the generations and centuries of, of, of white farmers who had before. So the Japs came to the United States mostly as laborers, but within a few decades really became a, an agricultural power across the West Coast. This picture is taken in Oregon in the 19 teens, I believe it was 1915. And at that point, up and down the West Coast from Vancouver all the way down to San Diego, Japanese uh, immigrants and at that point, Japanese Americans, their children had really come to dominate a lot of parts of, uh, of this agricultural world. So even by 1910, Japanese farmers controlled 70% of the strawberry market in California. By 1941 in Los Angeles County alone, Japanese farmers and Japanese American farmers controlled two out of every three acres of agriculture uh, and controlled every planted acre of peas, beets, broccoli, celery, and cauliflower within Los Angeles County. So we often think about, as we think about Pearl Harbor as an issue of, of, of military necessity. Whereas what I tried to do in the book was showcase that, while that is true, that was the argument that was made, this was really something that folks have been trying to do for decades. And uh, farmers especially had always fought Japanese and Japanese Americans as they climbed that agricultural ladder on the West Coast. Because basically what happened was they looked at, when, when Japanese farmers first came to the United States, they, like I said, they were laborers and some white farmers paid them in this sort of scrubland. So areas of uh, the San Gabriel Valley in California or old, logged apple orchards in Oregon. And what the Japanese farmers did was they turned it into some of the most profitable land that you can imagine. So everything that's in Silicon Valley now, all that farmland was dominated by uh, berry farmers in California uh, of, of Japanese descent. And they got so powerful and their agricultural land was worth so much money that white farmers were looking for ways to get them off of that land, whether that was through 
alien land laws or when they finally saw an opportunity at Pearl Harbor to sort of circumvent uh, the decades of work that the Japanese farmers had done and uh, sort of they began pushing politicians, their politicians in California and then politicians back on the East Coast to, you know, to, to really uh, try to get the, the Japanese and Japanese Americans off the land. So then when Pearl Harbor happens, all these groups snap into action uh, and it sort of becomes this ground up um, uh, force from, from, like I said, from everyone from farmers and ranchers to local politicians, all the way up to these groups like the Native Sons of the Golden West and the American Legion. And eventually these ideas sort of trickled their way up to the War Department uh, at, uh, in the Pentagon in, at, in Washington. And what you see here is the very beginning, the first days of Heart Mountain. And how we got there was, um, you know, it, it was sort of an, a, a, a terrible moment in United States history. And it's the, a lot of the is the work of one man whose name is Carl Benditson, who grew up in a, a logging community in Washington and worked his way up through the War Department and eventually landed a job uh, in Washington, D.C. And when Pearl Harbor happened, he snapped into action and tried to find a way to justify the removal of tens of thousands of, of Americans of Japanese descent and their, uh, their Japanese elders who had been ineligible for citizenship for the, the decades that they'd been in the United States. And Bendison sort of gets this bug in his ear about removing all of the, the West Coast Japanese and Japanese Americans. And he finds a kindred spirit in a man named John DeWitt, who was the head of uh, one, one of the military zones on the West Coast uh, and in charge of pretty much all of the Western Defense Command, which was almost all the United States west of the Rocky Mountains. So Bendison has this idea and hatches it with DeWitt to sort of force the rest of the government's hand in terms of removing the, uh, the Japanese and the Japanese Americans from the West Coast. And the thing that uh, I always sort of come back to when it comes to their military necessity argument is that if you look at the, the largest Japanese community in the United States at that point was in Los Angeles County, but it was neck and neck with the group of Japanese and Japanese Americans in Hawaii. And we never hear about the internment and the incarceration of Japanese Americans in Hawaii because it didn't happen. So sort of this capriciousness of argument where the United States thought that Japanese and Japanese Americans on the West Coast were a danger to the United States, but the folks in Hawaii weren't. And that just shows uh, how unnecessary the, the entire endeavor was. And that was because the Hawaiian commander saw Japanese Americans for who they were, which was loyal Americans. And that was because for years and years, the United States had surveilled and had spies in the Japanese and Japanese American communities along the West Coast and in Hawaii. And all these intelligence reports that would come back to the War Department, to Naval Intelligence, to the FBI, all said the same thing. And that was that there might be a few isolated instances where some folks feel some allegiance to Japan, but the broad majority of Japanese Americans and their uh, the older generation of, of Japanese immigrants were loyal to America, or they would just say nothing and be calm and and you know be you know pretend to quote be supporting the United States. All of those intelligence reports were ignored, some purposefully and some just sort of pushed aside when the the fervor for removal grew too much. So when Benditson and DeWitt had this idea to remove all Japanese Americans from the West Coast, that eventually made its way to the top of the War Department and eventually made its way to Roosevelt's desk. And that led to Executive Order 9066, which led to the creation of the War Relocation Authority and the removal of 120,000 uh, folks of Japanese descent in the United States. So this, like I said, this is sort of the beginning stages. These are folks showing up at Heart Mountain the days that it's opening, which was in August of 1942. Uh, this is, uh, if anyone has seen my book, this is sort of a famous photo from Heart Mountain of two young men uh, right after Heart Mountain opens. If you look at it, the thing that this photo really does for me is just shows how desolate 
this area of Wyoming was and how there was just, they basically removed all the scrub brush to be able to put up these barracks. And what that did when you remove millennia of scrub brush is it led to these terrible dust storms uh, because the, the scrub brush and the grease wood and sage were the only things holding down this really fine silt uh, into the ground. And as soon as it was all removed, there would be blinding dust storms where you couldn't see 20 feet in front of you. Uh, and I, I've traveled to Wyoming a lot for this book in terms of research, and it can pretty quickly, driving across Wyoming can pretty quickly go from, you know, a bright, sunshiny day to being in the middle of a sandstorm and dust storm that uh, you have to pull your car over to the side of the road. And I can't imagine what it must be like there if you were living in a, a tar paper shed, which is what 11,000 folks from the Los Angeles area and some from Seattle and some from San Francisco were, were forced to do in 1942. This is Heart Mountain at night, uh, just a few months after it opened and you can see everything in the distance. And that, you know, that, that really sort of sums it up for me is that you can't see anything in the distance. This is all Heart Mountain. You can't see any other communities and that's because none other existed. Cody which is a town that existed 11 miles away and Powell about equal distantly. Um, the thing that I think about mostly when I think about these barracks is that when they built these barracks, each of them were built in about an hour. So you had someone's entire life built. <laughs> the only home that they were going to have for the next indeterminate amount of years was this house that had been built with green shrinking wood. So as soon as everybody showed up at Heart Mountain, the wood was already shrinking on the houses that they were expected to live in for the next year, two years, 10 years. Nobody knew at that point. So when everyone arrived, the first thing they had to do was try to plug the holes in the walls of these barracks, which was they would do with old newspapers and pictures and things from the Sears Robot catalog. And you also have to remember is that these folks, most of them came from Los Angeles County. So never, none of them had ever experienced winter before. When I was writing the book, I wanted to pull up and try to find how many folks had been alive and when was the last time that it actually dipped below freezing in Los Angeles County. And obviously I wrote a book mostly about teenagers. So I wanted to find if anybody that was on this high school football team had ever been alive in LA County when it had actually been freezing. And none of them had ever been in a temperature where it actually had ever dipped below 40. And none of them had ever seen snow before. And it was only three or four weeks after Heart Mountain opened in September that it snowed for the first time. So you have these kids that have been pulled from LA County, pulled from Hollywood, pulled from Most Felice, all these places across LA County that had spent most of their lives in short sleeve shirts and, and jeans, now having to scramble to find the money to buy a winter coat or to buy a winter hat. And the, the federal government did them no favors by either obviously the location or the sort of supplies that they, that they had at Heart Mountain at the time. And Heart Mountain wasn't alone in that. You think about the places that ended up having these camps across the West, whether it was California or Idaho or Arkansas, the United States government placed uh, these camps in some of the most inhospitable parts of the country. They're some of the worst places that have been passed over by every settler for the last decades and centuries of United States history. Everybody had passed over, whether it was the area where Heart Mountain is or where Minidoka is in Idaho or Hardin Lava Fields at Rower in Arkansas. They were drained swamps where there were still so many snakes that eventually the folks in the camp would capture the snakes and cook them because it was some of the only meat that they would get at that point. So, you know, not only were these camps dehumanizing and demeaning based, based on, on their existence, but their location just sort of furthered that. Um, and that was on purpose. The United States wanted to find parts of land that were cheap or free to use. Um, usually they were already owned by the federal government's uh, one of the different bureaus that the federal government had to, to own land across the West, or some of them were placed on Indian reservations without even consulting uh, the Indian reservations that the, these, <laughs> these new camps that were not entirely dissimilar from the Indian reservations would also be placed 
on their land. Um, the thing is that with, with Heart Mountain, I said it was 11,000 people when it opened, which meant that it immediately became the third largest city in the state of Wyoming. You know, Wyoming still is our smallest state when it comes to population. And at that point, just having a community of 11,000 people meant that it was immediately became the third biggest, uh, you know, quote, metropolis in, in the state of Wyoming, which meant that, you know, the, the city itself, the city of Heart Mountain, the camp, had hospital, had schools, none of them of any good, uh, of any real quality when the camp first opened. Um, and they were entirely run by uh, you know, white Americans. And not only were they run by white Americans, but any sort of Japanese culture was to be removed. So whether that was uh, Japanese language um, books or uh, any sort of records or any uh, cultural, anything culturally Japanese was not only frowned upon, but in a lot of ways it had already been removed from their possession before they ever got to camp. Um, that said, one of the first things that they did when they first opened the camp was set up sports fields. Uh, in the Japanese American community, athletics uh, on the West Coast was huge. So whether that was baseball or basketball or uh, you know track, softball, lots of different uh, sports were set up. And then as soon as the camp opened, everybody that was at the camp realized that if we're going to have any sort of semblance of our real life, the one way to do that pretty quickly is to establish sports leagues. So they set up, they, they scraped some land and put up a baseball diamond, and then they built a football field. And pretty quickly, football became this surprisingly popular sport at Heart Mountain. So they had leagues for everybody from as, as young as elementary school up through men in their 30s and 40s. Now, back on the West Coast, even for years before, there had been some Japanese football leagues. Folks had played football in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. They had played the first um, game that's ever been recorded as being a game between uh, either Chinese or Japanese players in 1906 in San Francisco when a group of Chinese immigrants played a game against Japanese immigrants. Uh, and then some of these teams really sort of barnstormed. They went up and down. They went from Seattle and played in Vancouver, some played in Portland. And then in Los Angeles, the sports community really, really grew. And they created something called the Nisei Athletic Union, which was a way for Japanese American athletes to still compete, but also be able to, you know, compete despite the fact that a lot of the white leagues didn't want them to play against. So that so they created leagues that were just for Japanese immigrants and for their children. And, you know, in Los Angeles County, this was especially popular with baseball and basketball. And then those kids that played really well in those sports eventually decided, hey, what we really want to do, if we're really going to sort of succeed in sport, is we have to, we have to play American football. And if we want to sort of be accepted by our peers in our high school community, that's one way for us to sort of display our quote Americanness. And so when the camp opened, they created this football league that was in the fall of 1942. It took until the fall of 1943 for them to finally get any sort of high school games on the schedule. And when they first started having let me, let me back up for one step and that the camp had, uh, like I said, the administration was all white. And in one situation, the athletic director was this white coach who had also been an athletic director at some of the other schools around the state. So he had these connections with lots of other coaches. And what he was able to do was sort of call in a couple favors to football teams across Northwest Wyoming and Southern Montana and say, hey, we've got these kids here. They've got nothing to do. They're bored out of their minds. And all they want to do is do the things that they used to do back at home. Would you guys be open to scheduling some football games with us? And I think, you know, in terms of my research and what I saw is that a lot of teams said yes, thinking, okay, you know, we'll go, you know, we'll play this team from this, uh, this camp uh, of Japanese Americans. We'll, we'll win. We'll get an easy W. 
we'll go back to our high school with with an easy win and we'll we'll have one win in the column when we try to get into the playoffs that year and this team this this group here of the heart mountain eagles decided that that wasn't how they were you know they weren't just going to roll over on this so in the in august of 1944 the call went out excuse me august of 1943 the call went out that we were going to put together a high school football team 40 kids showed up for the first day of practice and only three of them had ever played high school football before so uh basically they were just trying to recruit as many players as they could so they were recruiting kids from baseball basketball track so they're recruiting shortstops and pole vaulters and anybody that had any sort of athletic ambition or talent they're saying we're going to put together a football team come out and uh you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna try to win some games so like i said this is the uh this is the 1943 team and if you look here all the way on your right the guy in the hooded sweatshirt is the one of the main characters in my book, and his name is Babe Namora. So Babe was the starting running back at Hollywood High School in Los Angeles before camp. And, you know, for years afterwards, after camp closed and for decades later, he was sort of known by lots of folks as the greatest Nisei athlete of, of a Japanese athlete of all time. So Nisei is the first generation of Japanese Americans. And Babe could play any sport. So he would play baseball and dominate baseball. He would play softball. He would play basketball. He was a decathlete. And then uh, he made his way onto the football field at Hollywood High and became the starting running back uh, on the varsity team and then got sent to camp. And, you know, like any high schooler, you feel despondent. You don't really know what to do. But football was his one outlet where he knew that he could dominate he knew that he was as good or better than most players in los angeles as starting running back at hollywood high so the first season in 1943 he was a star running back at the eagles and then he graduated and then he became their coach for the second season the reason i like this photo um not only because it, it shows the team but it also kind of gives a little bit of behind the scenes as to how i got some of these photos so if you look at it, you'll see a lot of the names are signed. And that's because at Heart Mountain High School, they had yearbooks, just like any other high school would have had in the 40s. And so I was able to find a lot of these firsthand photos of the football team by going through old yearbooks that some of the players' families uh, had provided to me and digging through the archives at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, which is a, a great museum where the camp used to be in Northwest Wyoming. So if you go through some of these photos when I'm showing them and you see that they have, uh, you know, they have their names on them, that's because uh, I found them from a, a certain, either a signed photo in a family photo album or from a yearbook. These are the, uh, this is another photo from the cover of my book, as you can see, and these are the senior members of the Heart Mountain Eagles. And, you know, this photo sort of tells a, a lot of things too, not just that it's a football team but it also shows you see how many players are in different sort of helmets and different pads and different shoes and the reason is that while the sports existed at heart mountain the camp gave them very little budget to do anything that they actually wanted to do with so the goal posts were made out of wood the uniforms were the same uniforms that they practiced in every day um, they didn't have any alternating uniforms they just had to use the same uniform game in and day in and day out of practice for the second season, for them to finally get a set of tackling dummies, the student government actually at the school hosted a fundraiser just to raise money for the football team. So now we're getting into some of the more uh, professionally shot photos here. And at Heart Mountain, they had a few photographers that sort of surreptitiously took pictures from camp. So some folks even went so far as to have secret dark rooms underneath their um, the barracks where they developed some of their photos. And that's where some of these photos are coming from here. This is an all-star game that the Eagles, the high school team played against a group of uh, men, 20 somethings from across uh, the rest of the camp. So they basically put together a team and said, oh, you guys think you're good. You think you're, <laughs> you think you're a good high school team, come play us. And, and the Eagles beat them. Um, 
What I also like about this photo is if you look in the background, you could see all of the fans. And the one thing that the Eagles had going for them is that while they had to play every game at camp, so every high school would come into camp to play the Eagles. So these teams from across Wyoming and across Montana would come into camp to play them. So while they couldn't leave camp, that also meant that they had this sort of amazing home field advantage, which I don't think most people would consider um, having to play a game from concentration camp in most cases as a home field advantage. But when you also have an audience of 11, a possible audience of 11,000 people, that meant for a lot of the games that the Eagles played, four or 5,000 people would show up and line the field, six, eight, 10 people deep. There were no bleachers. So everyone was sort of jammed in trying to get a shot of what the Eagles plays were looking like. Um, and, you know, that was really a, an advantage for the Eagles. So these three men right here are three of the main characters of the book. On the left is Babe Namora, who I talked about before. On the right is Keiichi Ikeda, who is actually the only living Eagle that I was able to speak to for the book. And in front is George uh, Horse Yoshinaga, who, um, if anyone has read the book, uh, knows he goes on to become the most famous Japanese American newspaper columnist of his day. Uh, and he gets a start here on the Eagles football team. He had played high school football in Mountain View, California, which many of you will recognize now as the, <laughs> the thing that pops up on your screen when you open a new Apple product. But at that point, he grew up as the family in a family of strawberry farmers in Mountain View, California. And when the war started and they were sent to camp, George's family had to sell their strawberry farm um, for pennies on the dollar. And now that land is worth about $4 million an acre uh, because it's the Silicon Valley headquarters of Microsoft and many, many other uh, you know, tech companies that you would, you would know. So I always think that, you know, I, I, you know, I, I just think that the, the idea of, of how much of our American economy has been built on the land or the backs of, of folks who had really no say in that. And I think that George's family is a really good example of that. Um, besides that, these are three of the best Eagles players. And like I said, Babe, and then Kichi goes on to playing in uh, a lot of sort of semi-pro basketball leagues after the war. Um, these pictures are from the Hart Mountain High School yearbook, which I'm sure you could tell from some of the way that they had to be scanned in. Um, I love these photos. I didn't put them in the book um, because they, they weren't as high of a resolution as I'd like. But especially this photo on the left, I really love because it sort of shows the total surprise of this high school player from Wyoming that he got beat on this route by uh, by this uh, Japanese American athlete here at Heart Mountain. And the foot on the right, I love because it sort of shows that there was no, there's nothing that these kids wouldn't do to try to win this game. So the field that they were playing on, there was no grass. During gym class, the teachers would have kids walk the field just to try to pick up rocks to make sure that the ground was as soft as it could possibly be for the football team to play on. And you still see these kids just putting their bodies on the line to play and to try to win for this Eagles team. And I think a lot of that, you know, when I was talking to Kichi Ikeda, who is, again, like I said, the one living player that I was able to speak with, the one thing that I kept coming back to was I would talk to him and say, like, Kichi, you know, do you really think, or excuse me, do you, do you think, did, did you understand what, what you were doing in camp? Did you understand, like, what having such an inspirational team, a, a team that went undefeated in their first season. And, you know, I won't give too much away about the second season, but they were equally as dominant in the second season. What did, what, you know, what did you think you were achieving on the football field? And he just said, well, we just wanted to play football. You know, we were 16 and 17 years old and we were there to play football. We weren't there to be something bigger for this community. But if you go back through the newspaper records of the time, you go through oral histories like I did for this book, you really come to see just how much this football team meant to the community at Heart Mountain. You know, these people were taken against their will from their home, had to sell all their possessions, can only come into camp with what they carried. And all of a sudden, this group of teenagers 
that you know were their children or their grandchildren or their peers started becoming this unstoppable football team and you know that had to have been inspirational in the camp on on some level and i think that was reflected in the camp itself there was a uh, a weekly newspaper called the heart mountain sentinel and it was very professionally done they they found anybody that had a a scrap of 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 journalistic strength or or writing prowess and put them on this staff and every week that the eagles played the scores would be splayed across the headlines they'd have three or four different stories written they'd have box scores columns previews of next week's game reviews of the previous week's game full game reports so a lot of what i was able to find to write this book was because of just how um incredibly thorough this newspaper was at uh, you know, sort of highlighting and chronicling the history of these kids as they were living it at this camp. Um, this picture is actually taken from the very last game the Eagles ever played, which was against uh, a, a team from Casper Natrona High School, which was one of the more dominant teams in Wyoming State then and now. They had won four of the previous six state championships and they came into camp um, and the Eagles, you know, this, the very final game, the Eagles are also undefeated and they come in to play this team from Casper. And this player here is by the name of Leroy Pierce, number 37, who was just, he was the state player of the year. As you can see, he's, <laughs> I refer to him as the book as in the book as a refrigerator of a teenager. Cause he was just built like he would have to squeeze through any door frame. And the one thing that the Eagles had, did not have, as is probably obvious, is much size. So the average Eagle player was about 35 or 140 pounds. And that meant that every game they were outweighed by their opponents by close to 40 or 50 pounds. So basically what they had to figure out how to do was they had to figure out how to play a brand of football that sort of... <laughs> Uh, counterbalance and counteracted against the fact that they had no size. So what that meant was they played a, a game that was really quick. Uh, the hurry up offense wasn't a thing at that point uh, in football history, but the Eagles sort of played uh, a prototype version of that all the way back in 1943 and 1944. So they would just try to get to the line really quickly, get the ball off quick. They would run more of sort of a spread offense, uh, which was again, very different for the time when most people were still running the ball pretty much consistently. Um, scores of, of the time then were usually, you know, seven, six or, or 14 to seven. They were very, very low scoring affairs. And the Eagles came in and would put up 20, 30, and sometimes up to 60 points on some of the opposing teams. And that's because they played sort of this confusing offense. So they would do a lot of different end arounds and flea flickers, and they would switch the backs in and out, spread their ends out wide. And it was really a style of football that nobody in Wyoming or Montana had ever seen before. And because of that, the Eagles were able to be successful in a way that I don't think um, anyone expected them to. Uh, I, love, I love this. Um, I was able to spend a lot of time with Babe Namora's family um, while I was researching the book. And what this is, is uh, Babe's varsity letter from Heart Mountain. So it just sort of shows how important these pieces of Americana were to these teenagers who again were were Japanese Americans but in their minds they were they were Americans first and and that was what was always so evident to me in the work and the research of this book um and I know that this item right here is a really treasured um uh heirloom in the in the Nomura family another thing I get into the book uh that is uh also lesser known is these folks right here are the Heart Mountain Draft Resistors. So while everyone was in the camp, the War Department also thought that it would be uh, expedient for them to begin drafting Japanese Americans out of the camps to the front lines in France and Italy. And there was a large group of folks at Heart Mountain who said, no, I I'm not going to do that. And we're not going to, um, until our citizenship rights are restored, or at least we have some sort of semblance of uh, understanding of, of what our rights are as Americans. We will not fight in this war. If you let us out of the camps, we'll gladly go to the front lines because we're loyal Americans. 
but um, if not, we won't be uh, showing up for our, our draft physicals. And what you see here again is a group of 63 young men who resisted the draft and then ended up becoming uh, part of the largest mass trial in Wyoming state history here. And they were eventually uh, convicted and sent to federal penitentiaries in Kansas and Washington state. Um, I wanted to sort of end on this image here, which is one of the images that led me to the story of the Eagles and why I think, why, why it struck me as, as an interesting story and, and one that I couldn't get out of my head. So back in 2014, I was working a freelance story for a magazine called Cowboys and Indians. And they sent me on assignment to, to Yellowstone National Park and Heart Mountain actually sits right outside of Yellowstone. And one day I had some downtime. So I went to the museum there and that was where I first learned the story of the Eagles and walked out and was really floored by how little of this history of incarceration and Japanese American life that I really knew about. And so I started thinking about it more and more, but this image I saw at the museum, and this is the one that I always think about when I think about what life must have been like for a teenager at Heart Mountain. Because you look at these kids, and if you put a thumb over their face and sort of take away the barracks, it could be a picture taken of any white, black, Latino, Asian teenager in 1942 in the United States. You look at his style, you look at his haircut, you look at the way they're just sort of milling about. So when I looked at this, I thought to myself, you know, this is sort of a universal story here. This is a story about Americans that weren't treated as such by their government. So this story and, and this image are what always stick in my mind. This image specifically always sticks in my mind, even though none of the characters in the book are in it. I always think about this photo when I think about what the United States government did to 120,000 Japanese Americans. Because you look at this and you can't take away and can't sort of hide from the Americanness of this image. Um, and that's uh, you know pretty much the, the end of what I have to say. But if, if any folks have have questions, I'm I'm happy to uh, talk through that. Um, but uh, you know, again, thank you so much for for having me today. Um, and I'm you know I'll gladly uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Bradford. That was excellent. Um, if you got any questions? Make sure you use the chat feature like we do. Um, um, you talk about one one of the things that uh, Bradford didn't mention. Not only did they were they undefeated, they were unscored upon. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that that this this cobbled together team was uh, was not that not only did they win, they were they, they no he scored on them. Yeah. Um, as they put together a team, they're trying to have some sense of normalcy. How was it that they were able to get? Coaches, uh, equipment, uh, refs, uh, you know, you, and and you also mentioned too that you they had a they had someone who could call in a favor, but they also had teams that just flat out turned them down. Yeah. They couldn't play. They, they didn't. They didn't have a game every week. They tried to, yeah. but they did. Right. So, yeah. talk, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, one of the things that I uh, uh, like you said was was really hard was that they had all these sort of institutional barriers too. So while they had folks that wanted to, to, to help, so whether it was coaches or whatever, they also had to figure out how do, how do we get people to play us? You know, like you said, we don't have any equipment. We don't have this. So a lot of times there were fun drives that, again, the student government or a, a, a pep club or folks would um, sort of pass the hat around to throughout the barracks. And, you know, one of the things that they were so successful upon was, like I said, they did have this one white coach, but he pretty quickly took a back seat to uh, a coach who all the kids belovedly just called Tubby, who is this Japanese American former player who had grown up in LA. And before the war, he was working uh, at a fruit stand. And he sort of gets the call because they know that Tubby used to play college football at, at Los Angeles City College, which was the junior college back in LA. So they sort of say like, hey, Tubby, like we know you have this sports experience. Can you come in and just sort of shepherd these kids? 
And he really revolutionized their offense because he saw a couple of things that they, that he had remembered them, his coach doing back in Los Angeles. And he applied that to the Eagles. Uh, as to your point about uh, other teams. Yeah. I mean, there's no, the teams from Cody and Powell, which are the two closest communities uh, refused to play the Eagles in regular season games. So Cody played them once uh, in a scrimmage and the Eagles beat them 45, nothing. And after that, the Cody team pulled their schedule game off the schedule. So the first season you have, uh, you know, folks coming in and the, the folks at heart mountain trying to schedule games and having a hard time because it was, you know, kind of hard to convince folks to come into this uh, incarceration camp to play this Eagles team. But then by the second season, you had a hard time building a schedule because nobody wanted to lose to this team that was so thoroughly beating everyone. Like, like you said, Mark, you know, they were unscored upon until the very last game they ever played in camp. So, um, you know, th and that sort of goes to their style too, because at that point, players are playing both ways. They're playing offense and defense. So by them being in better shape and being able to run their, their teams, other teams off the field, they were having an advantage on both sides of the ball because everyone was just exhausted. Um, and nobody wanted, nobody, you know, the, uh, the, the racism of the times didn't end um, at the camp gates. You know, those, those young men didn't want to lose to this team made up of, of 130 pound Japanese Americans, just as much as maybe their coaches or their parents didn't want them to play to begin with. One of the things for people that want, that haven't read the book and, and, and want to, um, Mr. Pearson does a really good job, really thorough job of explaining, um, as you let in your opening comments, the backdrop of what went into these camps. And, and you know, the, the, this didn't just start on December 8th, 1941. And there was a lot of, a lot of lead time to that. Um, the very first words that, you wrote in your book were words matter. And, and it's, it's author's notes and you, and you make it a point to say that you're not gonna sit there and, and use the euphemisms of relocation centers or, or um, internment camps. These, these were essentially prisoners. You know, they, 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 this, this was essentially a jail. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you were pretty, pretty upfront about that. And I could, I could see, if anybody else has read the book, I felt that there was a lot of, ang you were angry writing this book. Is that <laughs> fair to say? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting because I've had to sort of, you should have seen the first draft. It was a lot, I think a lot angrier. Um, so I, I'm glad that you brought up the thing about the terminology because a lot of folks do bring it up and it's something that was important to me. And like you said, for folks who haven't read it, basically what I, I sort of go into is, is that when we sort of colloquially refer to this period of time, we refer to it as the period of, of Japanese internment. And I explain how both of those words in this context are, are wrong. And that, you know, the majority of the folks in these camps were Japanese Americans and that the term internment kind of, is, is, there's a very specific legal use of what internment actually is in terms of it being for enemy aliens, so folks who are, you know, uh, Japanese that are considered enemies, so people who are actually Japanese citizens in that case. And there was a whole separate system run by the Department of Justice for those kinds of folks, um, no matter how sort of slapdash and unnecessary those camps were, is a totally separate book that other people have already written. But for me, it was really important to say, like, no, what, you know, this is incarceration and the time. At the time, these were referred to as concentration camps. Fr Franklin Roosevelt referred to them as concentration camps. Newspapers across America referred to them as concentration camps. And only after the war, when concentration camp became synonymous with uh, the exter German extermination camps in Europe, did the term internment camp slowly come to mean what we think of now as the Japanese American concentration camps. And I think that's understandable, you know, in a lot of ways to sort of say the term concentration camp is hard to hear because everyone's first thought goes to those extermination camps, understandably. 
And what I say in the book is, you know, this, my use of that is not to conflate the experiences in these camps in the United States with those camps in Europe, because th there's very little comparison. Like I said, I mean, there was a high school football team. So that wasn't happening at Dachau, you know? And I think that most Japanese Americans don't expect folks to think and compare those two um, kinds of camps. But at the same time, I wanted to really um, use the terminology that the Japanese American community uses today, especially as someone coming from outside of that community, I wanted to, I knew it was really important for me to not only use the right terminology, but to really work hard to make sure that this was a book that honored the people, not only the characters in the book, not only the, those players and their families, but the Heart Mountain community at large and the Japanese American community writ large in the United States. Um, and I, you know, I, I still don't know if I, I fully accomplished that, but so far, uh, folks have been uh, really positive about the reflection of the community in, in the book. So. Uh, so getting back to your original point, I was pretty angry writing it, <laughs> but I was also kind of angry at myself for not knowing more of this history to begin with. So I was upset with uh, the history itself, but then also with myself for, for not knowing it, which is why I think I worked so hard to try to chronicle that history before the war too. And that's what I, those, those two words, I, I couldn't shake those, the reading the book, words matter. You know, that, that, that's your very first two words you, that you wrote and, and it stuck with me through the, the whole book. Oh, um, some, quest, some questions here. What happened to their homes and businesses that, that were taken away from them? Uh, yeah, it, that's, you know, one of the sadder parts of this, which is, you know, a full, a very long list of sad things. But right after the executive order was signed and before everyone was sent to the camps, pretty much folks had to make do. So uh, they knew that if, if maybe they had a kindly white neighbor who would look after a house or a farm for them, but, but most Japanese Americans didn't. So they ended up having to sell their homes and all their belongings for pennies on the dollar. So you had people who were just, you know, white folks who were driving around lowballing people saying they'd give them 20 cents for a fridge or 150 bucks for a house. And a lot of Japanese Americans were forced to take that very small amount of money um, just because they knew that if, if not, then it would either be taken over or folks would become squatters in their house while they were gone and they would have very little recourse. You know, they, there, there was very little confidence in the United States government that the government would do the right thing uh, when they just gotten uh, word that they were going to be sent to a camp. So I think the federal government said that they would try to protect folks' property, whether it was storing it uh, at the Federal Reserve, which some folks did, um, as some of the Federal Reserves in, in uh, San Francisco. But a lot of folks ended up selling their, their, their whole lives for, for a few dollars. And uh, Babe Namora, who is one of the main characters in the book, his family ran a boarding house in Hollywood. And they were lucky enough to have someone come and run their boarding house for the for the years that the war was going on and you know so i was able to go through and even looking um through some of the archives at the national archives which are some of the files they have files of every person who was in camp at the national archives and i was able to go through and see these letters that were going back and forth between babe's father and this white woman uh uh, whose name was Marion, and she was taking care of it. So he would, you know, figure out how to pay the mortgage. And he was doing all this by letter from Wyoming back to, to Hollywood, which shows that even the folks that were able to, you know, sort of hang on to their property, were still having to deal with all of these, you know, these bureaucracies of, of, of mortgages and rents and the FBI coming to, to check on your house while you were gone. Um, and I wrote about it, not in the book, but uh, this past summer, I was lucky enough to write a little bit more about Japanese American incarceration for a section for the New York Times this past summer that explored what happened sort of in the waning days of World War II in the years right after. And, you know, I, I talked a lot about the folks who had lost all of their homes, and a lot of them ended up in trailer camps up and down the West Coast because they had no home to return to. Um, so they went from one sort of camp to another camp, just one without barbed wire. 
So uh, the, the economic issues, you know, didn't end on VJ Day and when the camps closed a few months later. Um, did any of them ever get reparations um, yeah. for this? Yeah, so in the late 80s, the United States government through years and years uh, of uh, trying with, with the Japanese American community, uh, eventually gave checks of uh, $20,000 to surviving folks from the camps. Um, and it was, you know, it, 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 obviously reparations are a very touchy subject here in the United States today when, uh, when we think about it when it comes to slavery. And you look at how much it took for this to happen to in the Japanese American community. And I don't know if it necessarily provides a blueprint for any, excuse me, any, any other sort of reparations going forward, but it, it took a lot of time and a lot of negotiation within Congress. And eventually it ended up that uh, Reagan eventually signed it, so. Uh, you mentioned in, in the talk, uh, about the 63 who refused uh, in, in induction into, you know, into the draft. Talk more about that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like I had said, basically the War Department reinstated the draft. They tried to get volunteers initially in the spring of 1943 and volunteer numbers from the camps were abysmal. You know, basically this draft resistance movement began very quickly at Heart Mountain and a lot of that was because they had they had no clarity on their citizenship status. So they had no clarity as to whether they were technically full citizens at that point, whether they were citizens but were not allowed to leave the barbed wire or what it was. So you ended up having these young men whose, you know, internally their allegiances were being questioned and their loyalties to whether their country or their family themselves and what their, their families wanted them to do. And the reason that I tried to include some of that in the book was that these kids that were on the Heart Mountain football team were the kids who were being asked to make these, to answer this question as to whether, where their loyalty stood. And it was a question that was, I, I feel like unfair to ask these kids because they had been put in this position by their government, their government, wasn't going to let them out of camp. And that was one of the big questions was, okay, so say we go and we volunteer or we, or we go to our induction ceremony and we go to France, we go to Italy and, and we come back to the United States um, on, on leave. Are we asked, are we then going to have to go back into camp, even though we just spent the last six months or year fighting the war for the United States? And there were no good answers there. Um, so you had a lot of folks who did sign up for the war and, and did get inducted and did listen and did go to their, their draft physicals. And those men, a lot of them ended up in the 442nd Regiment, which was an all Japanese American unit that ended up becoming one of the most decorated units in the United States Army history. There's a mural uh, uh, honoring them. Uh, in the Pentagon, uh, Daniel James Brown, who wrote Boys in the Boat, has a brand new book coming out in May. Uh, an advanced copy of it just landed here in the house. It's somewhere. Uh, and he wrote a whole book about, about the regiment that's coming out soon. So, you know, it, it, you had a lot of folks who were making a lot of very difficult decisions. And in the Japanese and Japanese American community, the decision of these draft resistors was really looked down upon for decades and decades. And it wasn't until um, the 80s and 90s that they really started getting some sort of respect for how difficult of a stance it must have been for them to take uh, and you know, to spend the next years in federal prison for taking this stand. Um, and I think I mentioned it briefly in the book, but the thing that I think sort of highlights that bravery in taking that stand is that there were a couple of the men that once they got out of federal prison signed up and then went and fought in Korea. So th their, their arguments were always truthful. Their arguments were always, if you give us our rights, we are loyal Americans and we will go fight because that's our duty as Americans of draft age. But you just need to try to meet us halfway here. And the United States government refused. You mentioned raising funds for the team by passing the hat. 
Do the incarcerated families have a source of income while in the camps? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting in that um, at the camp that the, the, there were jobs, you know, there were there were teachers and there were mechanics, there were farming, uh, there were all these jobs in the camp. But the most money that you could make in the camp, even if you had a PhD and you were or a, an actual, you know, a medical doctor was one dollar less than the monthly pay for an army private. The WRA had set it up so that the optics of it from their standpoint, that nobody in nobody of Japanese descent in the United States in a camp will be making more than I, I, I suppose the rationale was then our, our, our brave army soldiers. But what the WRA did pretty early on, uh, and this came at the sort of demand and behest of a lot of Western governors, was that they let some folks, mostly men, out of the camps to go work um, in agriculture and railroad industry across the West. And there they made a lot more money. So you had folks who would pull sugar beets, you had folks that were laying down rail ties, you had lots of different industries across the West that, you know, whose entire labor base was fighting, uh, fighting this war. So that was where if folks wanted to make a little bit of money, they a little bit more money, the camp would let them out after they'd been approved by uh, the, the administrator at each individual camp. And then they would go, you know, pull sugar beets in Montana or Colorado or Utah or work a segment of rail in, in Walla Walla, Washington or, or whatever that may be. Um, so that's why some folks had a little bit more money, but it's still the wages were not, you know, they, they treated them poorly. They treated them not much better than uh, they would have been treated at, at, at the camp itself. And they lived in just as terrible conditions. Some of them lived in chicken coops while they were pulling sugar beets. So it just wasn't, uh, uh, they were making more money, but it, it wasn't a better life. I got the impression that you got the impression when, when interviewing some of the people that they were more puzzled than embittered after upon reflection is that a fair statement yeah and and again it, you know that really you know that that changes just like a, a, any anyone today that really changes from person to person so there were times when i was going through old oral histories and and records and interviews where i would find something that was was puzzling you know like george horse yoshinaga who's one of the main characters really has uh, what I thought of as a kind of backwards thought about the camps where he said, you know, I went to the camp and I ended up leaving and going on to become this famous newspaper columnist. If I had never gone to camp, I would have spent my life as a strawberry farmer. I would have never left that patch of earth. So even though this bad thing happened, what happened afterwards is that I had a much better life. Um, most people do not <laughs> have the same sort of thought that George did about that. But there were other times where I was interviewing, um, especially some of the some of the widows of some of the players. So I was able to interview three of the widows of the Eagles. And what they said was, you know, we lived in camp as teenage girls. We got to hang out with our friends all the time. We got to go to dances. Um, so some of them left not as embittered as you'd expect either. Um, when you talk to some of the other Eagles though, and they said, my entire life was ruined. You know, I had everything pulled out from under me. I wanted to become an accountant. I wanted to go get a four-year degree. And I spent four years in this camp um, in the middle of nowhere. And then I get dropped back in Pasadena or wherever, penniless, and I have to start my life over again. Um, so I think that, um, like you said, there were some folks, the, the opinions of everybody changed as much as, you know, my opinion would change than the you know few dozen folks who are here tonight. So it was um, for me it was it was very interesting to see that some not everybody was as negative and and and, and bitter about the experiences as I expected them to be, or you know maybe I would have been. She wasn't in the book for long, but I think it, it's I got the impression that one of the people that made an impression on you the most was Eleanor Roosevelt with her, uh, her, her reaction to order 9066. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. Um, and I think that, you know, you brought it up at the top. Um, I, grew, I grew up in Hyde Park, New York. So I grew up sort of steeped uh, 
in this history of the Roosevelt's my entire life. Uh, I went to FDR High School. My the school mascot was the president's. You know, we used to go to FDR's home and library all the time on class trips. So I had this very specific image in my head of uh, of who Roosevelt was, and obviously this is the one of the biggest black marks on, on his record. But what it also did was it sort of opened my eyes to the and the enlightenment of of Eleanor Roosevelt and how much of an important role she played in Roosevelt's life, uh, obviously not, not, not only for this, but in lots of other ways. And what Roosevelt, what Eleanor Roosevelt did was pretty remarkable. And that she, she asked FDR, first of all, she asked him to have a Japanese American family come live in the White House to show that they were loyal Americans. After that was refused, she eventually convinced him to let her go visit one of the camps, which is in Gila River, Arizona. And after that, she really became an advocate for uh, the Japanese Americans, uh, sort of helping some of the folks unfreeze their bank accounts, um, get better conditions in some of the camps. Um, and I think that she was doing this when Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. It was the first time in their marriage that he didn't consult Eleanor on this really big public policy issue. And she was really hurt from that. And her biographer has said that that moment was the moment that their marriage kind of cleaved forever and, and, and never recovered from her hurt over that and who she then uh, interpreted and, and imagined her husband to be who would do this sort of thing to fellow Americans. And, you know, right after Pearl Harbor, she gave this speech at the Immigration Council in New York where she, she says, we're all Americans. We need to stand with our Japanese American neighbors, you know, treat them as your neighbors. That's who they are. And, you know, just two months later for Roosevelt to sign this executive order sort of went against everything that she believed in, not only as a person, but as his wife and sort of a, a political animal as well. And I came, I, I walked away from, from writing this book, wishing that I'd been able to spend more time talking about Eleanor Roosevelt. But I know that, you know, there's, three volume biographies that have been written about, about her. So I was able to find a little bit of room, a few different spots in the book to drop her in. Um, and one last thing, I, I was really glad you brought up about the native sons of the golden West. So when I read in your book, it's like, uh, it, for those that didn't uh, get it, 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 this is a group that essentially said that we, we form, we white people form California. And, 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 and that I'm, I'm thinking this is a, this is a state with, it's it's big cities are in Spanish, you know, San Diego, <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it, uh, it, it's it's economy is based on 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 Asian Americans coming here, especially Japanese Americans, and but it's but it's not them, it's us. So just, I'm, right. I'm glad you, I'm glad you had a slide of that. So yeah, that was um, something that I I always think that that's funny to think about. You know, this group saying like, oh, and they always consider they call themselves we uh, the hardy native sons of the Golden West. And you think about how much of that state was built on whether it was uh, Japanese, Chinese, or Mexican labor, and later, you know, sort of Filipino labor, and all these things, where you just think like it's uh, almost a, to a level of parody, where you can sort of put blinders on enough, and to to think that the, you're the folks who built this state on your own. I want to thank you very much for doing this. This this this, this has been this has been great. Uh, the, the book uh, is called "The Eagles of Hard Mountain," which and by the way, they they named themselves the Eagles because they wanted to show they were good Americans, right? That's right. why they picked yeah. that's why they picked that name. Uh, so thank you very much for doing this. Uh, awesome. uh, great great good luck with this book. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so continued success. Thank you and uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it.